I think that kind of like sums me up as a person, to be honest. <laughs> Um, I'm emo as fuck, but I come across as a relatively happy person. I'm Jen Thomas from Enemy, and today I'm joined by Josh from Yumi at Six for the latest in our In Conversation series. Can I just say I'm loving all the plants behind you? I mean, I've got them here and stuff as well. I can see them all behind you. It's almost like a little oh, bit. You. I'm a celebrity. Can you see the tree? You see the tree? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I give it a little bit of my yeah. No, nice. I, I was, I, for a second, I thought you were talking about your plants. I was like... Oh, yeah. I'm just going to rave about my own. <laughs> love, love the plants behind me, just here. Good. See it over your shoulder. See the tree and stuff as well. <laughs> oh, so no. you've got the new album coming out very soon, Sucker Punch. Yeah. How are you <laughs> feeling? Are you excited? Nervous? What are the general emotions at the moment? Yeah, pretty much all of the above. Um, it's just such a strange time to be trying to put up music, to be honest. It's not... Um, yeah, sometimes it's hard to like have that as a focus, but I know that we're all just eager for people to hear the, the record and that it feels like such a long time ago that we recorded it, but for a lot of people it's going to be very fresh. <clears throat> so we are kind of like remind ourselves that whenever like we're talking about it and we're talking about new music and that sort of stuff, it's like guys, let's get this record out first and make sure it has its moment. Um, but yeah. Really excited. There's some there's some songs on there that we're obviously really proud of. So every musician says that about their record. Is that they were, the latest? Is the current yeah, exactly. We're not going to jump on and be like, oh, the record sucks. Don't listen to it. But yeah, no, we're obviously all proud of it, and um, <clears throat> we're eager for people to hear it. Because you went to Thailand to record it, didn't you? So what was yeah. that like? How did that affect the record? Did it give it, uh, anything in the songs? Did it make a difference? Do you think, as opposed to if you'd just done it in London? I think <clears throat> the main the main uh, the main contributing factor that Thailand gave was that it acted as like a, I don't know, a vehicle for us to get out of the country and get out of our headspace um, individually and collectively. But, you know, when the conversation started about where should we go, it was like, do we go back to Vader where we made the last one or do we go to America? And we we're like, no, let's not do that. Let's not go to Belgium and all these other places that came up and we we're, Time was just kept kept staying on the list, so it's kind of like a process of elimination of places that we weren't too stoked to go to, and then we kind of thought we should use this as an opportunity, just as I said, to get out of the country and unplug from the world and um, really heighten our senses and our focus and just try and make something, you know, special. And um, I don't know if you've been to Thailand, but like, it's a very very special place. The people there are very very unique. They're so beautiful and um, welcoming and that just having that ever present sort of like, I don't know what the word I'm looking for to describe them is, but like, it's, it's pure maybe. I don't know. I've, I've never really been around people like that before. Um, and yeah, it was just good. We kind of use it as like a musical rehab, so to speak. And just, yeah, completely unplugged from the world. And we were in this tiny little fishing village about two and a half hours in Bangkok. So we were literally in the middle of nowhere, just the way we wanted it. So yeah, it was, it was sick. It's a case of no distractions, I guess. As you say, if you've removed, you've gone the other side of the world. Whereas if you're in London, there's always a risk of bumping into people at the shop when you go around the corner. If it's people, so it's just a complete fresh start, I guess, in a way. Yeah, yeah for sure. And like we kind of we're guilty of finding reasons to leave the studio sometimes as well. Like I know when we've made records in in Los Angeles, it's kind of like who's playing tonight, you know? And like, <laughs> You know what I mean? It was one of those, like, which one of our friends is playing a gig um, that we can, you know, jump to? And it's kind of, I don't know. I think maybe it was a process we needed to have. I think sometimes in the difficult moments of making records, we've had opportunities to get out and, like, duck it. Um, whereas with this, it's like, there's no escape. And if you're having a not a bad, not even a bad day, but just a challenging day, like a really where you feel like this song isn't going anywhere or whatever the issue might be. Like you really have to face it, um, face it head on, which we haven't historically done too much of. I don't think anyway, or at least maybe it's just from my side. Maybe I'm the one that's dodging all the bullets all the time. But um, yeah, no, we, we. It was great to have that distraction for sure. Of, of just the distraction of not having any distractions, if that makes sense. So um, yeah. It must be quite surreal from the fact that you went from that huge Gunnersville show 
to then going to Thailand, the other side of the world, to now spending the last few months like sitting at home in lockdown in your pants, doing a jigsaw puzzle or whatever. Is it strange yeah. when you look back? It must feel like it was a couple of years ago, never mind the start of this year. Yeah, it's that's kind of like in the least intense way, that's kind of part of the trauma of all of this, I think. Is that like, especially for musicians that weren't in cycle or weren't on touring is that like they may not have toured for you know we did a few festivals really but uh, we did, and we did Gunnersville but we haven't done a tour tour for since like April 2019 mm-hmm. when we went to Australia with with Bring Me and um, Frank Hart and the Rattlesnake so that's something that's just there's left like a massive void for all of us like it's the thing I think we miss the most that connection with people and I guess that sense of purpose as well but at the same time, you know, I've got really good at being lazy. Um, so that that's a positive. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it's been a, an interesting moment in time for humans in general, just to kind of take stock of what's good, what's important and w- what things they can afford to let go of. And um, yeah, so it's been, it's definitely been bizarre not having this thing that's been so... I don't know the magnitude of our band in our in our lives, <clears throat> and to not have that really, because we've we've made the record and we we've done some songwriting, we've done some some sessions in the studio. But as I said to you before, like the mindset's been really difficult to switch off from the fact that we haven't even put this record out yet. So to try and like I don't know leave it behind and crack on with something else and focus on that didn't feel necessarily right, and you know. I also didn't really feel like I had too much left to say. I said I said a lot of what I wanted to say on, on Sucker Punch. So <clears throat> it's been an interesting year, but I think it's been far more difficult for, you know, way, way more people than people in bands, you know. So I think we've got to get a bit of a bit of reality check and a bit of perspective on, on what's actually going on. And with the record, it sounds like it was a cathartic experience. I know you've mentioned wow. previously that <laughs> you and the band were going through some stuff when you went over there. And at one point you were thinking that it was going to be your final You Meet Six record, which obviously now to put the fans' mind at ease isn't the case. But having that mindset and being of that feeling while you were there, do you think that then bled into the record? You say you gave it everything you had. You were like, this is it, going to make the best record we've ever done. Yeah, I think that that's that was kind of it, and it wasn't like something that I wasn't feeling that way, you know, like halfway through making it. I went even before we started writing the record. I was like, I'm not really sure where else I want to go with this and what else I've got to do with it. But I think that you know maybe <clears throat> maybe it's turned out that maybe I needed this record more than any of the other guys in the band. You know, who knows? I think it's been it's been a record that we didn't know obviously what's transpired with, with this sort of pandemic, etc. but it's been a great help to me actually listening to our record quite regularly. Uh, I'm not ashamed to say we, I listen to it a lot. Um, a, it takes me back to there and, and being part of it. And it also, it kind of helps me sort of mull over some of the things I was feeling then and, and looking at it retrospectively and, and it, cause it's still like, it's almost like it's still ours, if that makes sense, because it hasn't been released. I'm like, I'm. It's like these are these are just our songs that are private and not they're on like a Dropbox link, you know, like no one's heard it yet. So I still kind of get to live in them. Or sorry, get to live in the songs with that that sort of headspace. But um, yeah, there was definitely like an intensity of like feeling like, well, if this is going to be a swan song, you better just let rip, and it better be amazing and give everything. And I kind of liked that, to be honest. I'd never really felt like that before when, when making music for for me at six. Maybe sometimes been slightly too comfortable, I don't know, but um, definitely felt like, yeah, this is going to be the last thing I do and I want to sign off, not in style, but I want to sign off with something that when people look at it and go, oh, he, you know, he really did what he came to do on that. And um, yeah, so I'm glad we that we had that kind of, I got a rise out of myself by doing that Mm -hmm. but you know at the same time then I remember like I spoke did a few interviews and I saw like the react where I said that and I was getting like the reactions from people both close to me and sort of like 
our fans as well from a distance being like, be a real shame if, if that was how it went down. So I think sometimes you don't. And again, this year has been one of those things that I think for a lot of people has put things in compartmentalized things and put things in perspective. And like, you know, there's definitely, um, as I said, I think for a lot of musicians and people that work in music in general, there's such a massive void without being able to do what they do that there's been times where I think people have not, I wouldn't say I've struggled, but I've definitely like, had a bit of an imposter syndrome going on. And I'm, I'm like, well, who am I? Like, if I'm not the guy from Yumi at six, do I have any true value? And I think that kind of like being that bare and sort of vulnerable and understanding that has been important and in itself as equally as cathartic as, as making the record, I think. So. I mean, you've had such longevity as a band and, and having the same lineup this whole time, as you say, that has been your identity for a very long time time now I mean is it quite surreal for you sometimes to look around and realize how many of your peers have kind of fallen by the wayside like how few bands are actually still going that started out at the same time as you yeah there's that and there's also like an enormous sense of pride and equally fucking hell we're lucky you know like we've had a black of the century (laughs) um because I yeah yeah (laughs) yeah exactly trust me there's a lot of other bands that we came through with who were, I wouldn't even say use the word better, but just amazing in their own way and certainly didn't deserve to not be able to be doing what they could have been doing. But I guess, um, you know, I don't know what how they would do put their stuff together and how they work internally, but I think we've always been very good at um, acting as like a support network for one another. And also we never really got ahead of ourselves like we never thought we were the shit we always as I said just kind of thought well we're just ordinary people doing something mental you know like we never thought that too highly of ourselves and and got caught up in the uh, the stereotype of being a in a band because there are stereotypes that come with that I guess um and yeah just feel very fortunate and I'm I'm really like I think that's the thing I'm most proud of that I've done it with with Matt, Dan, Max and Chris and and it's been our journey collectively and it hasn't been one that has been like one person's thing that other people have kind of hopped on and hopped off from you know like it's been us five the whole time um, and that has like you know we're rich in that sense that we've had that experience together so yeah I'm fortunate enough that I have heard the record obviously perks of being a journalist I've got to hear it before I talk to you so I know what I'm talking about and yeah. It does sound massive, sucker punch. I think I I said to you before that it's all killer, no filler to use the really cliched phrase, but every song could kind of stand alone as a single. And it almost feels a bit like you revel in reinvention and changing in a way. Because if you compare sucker punch to night people, which was very bluesy, it almost sounds like a totally different band, but it's still got a sense of cohesiveness to it. Is there a sense that, you like surprising people and kind of turning it on its head or is it a case of you're just doing what you want to do and what feels right at the time? Yeah. I mean, well, first of all, thank you. That's nicely to have said. Um, uh, I think it's, it's like a hybrid of a few things. One is that like we, to go alongside what I just said before about my own headspace before making this record, I think, there was a conversation of guys, let's not just put out music for the sake of putting out music, you know, like let's not turn into one of those bands that people hear they got a new record coming out. They already know what it's going to sound like before it comes out. And, you know, they may or may not buy a ticket to the show and you just crack on for a few more years and you just die out. Like if we're going to die out, that's cool, but we should do it in our own way. And um, so when it came to talking about um, making the record and, and what we had to do, we, we were all very, determined to like challenge ourselves and make sure that you know and, and it's interesting because like i'm sure there's people that will listen to the record and be like what is this guy talking about like it, it is what i expected from Unit six potentially but they're wrong but i mean like we we knew we had to incorporate some like some of our outside influences and try and merge it in with what we what we've been known for doing and, and i guess appreciate for doing in the past but you have to keep it interesting and i think if you can keep it interesting for yourselves as as a musician then you're going to keep it interesting for the, the listeners as, as well and you know i think 
I think with that, I wouldn't, I won't say which ones, but it's definitely records that we've made in the past, maybe not full bottom, the full thing, but songs in the past where I've known where it was going and it felt familiar, but not in a good way. It didn't scare me. I wasn't like, Oh God, what are people going to think of that? You know? And like when we, when we put out songs already as like little singles, little singles, you know what I mean? But when we put out songs so far from this record, I've like, I haven't been like, completely clued up as to what people are going to say or what people are going to feel or think. It's still that um, trepidation of, oh, are they going to like it? It's so a bit less field, yeah. And that kind of like is a bit of a buzz in itself, you know, like, are they going to hate it? Are they going to love it? Or are they going to be indifferent to it? You know, and I think that... It's worse often. Indifference is the worst of all of them. That is. I, I'd rather be... Loved. Good opinion, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I literally, I would literally rather be loved or hated. I don't really want to be sort of appreciated like and I and you know and that's for the for the most part I think maybe sometimes that's what attributes to a band being successful is there's just as many people that don't like them that mm -hmm. would idolize them and worship them you know or people that really don't get it and really don't want to fuck with it and there's people that like it's their bible you know like that album or that band or that personality or whatever it is so um and I guess we've had a we, we've been lucky because we've had a fan base that as as you said, it's sort of like, you know, I've been around for, it'll be 15 years this, this year. So it's like, that's pretty psycho in, it in itself. And I don't think you get there, especially during the last sort of, you know, 25, 30 years of the music industry without having a really, really strong fan base that are dedicated to what you're doing. And I think they'd rather, well, I can't speak for all of them, but I, for the most part, I think they're quite like minded in us that they don't want to hear us doing the same stuff over and over again. And, um, and I think most music fans want to hear something that is like totally true and um, isn't just forced or fake. They want to hear the honest version of yourself at that moment in time. So that's all we've done. And, and yeah, people will hopefully love it or hate it. Either way, don't be in the middle. I want you to have a strong opinion about it. Quite often the ones that hate it are the ones you talk about it the most. They'll be the ones that end up yeah. like spreading the word and telling you and messaging you. It's like, bring it on. Yeah. Like, still talking yeah. about it. Yeah. <laughs> I think you, I saw a Cat Williams stand up the other day. He's a, I don't know if you know about Cat Williams. He's a comedian, but like, he was like, he's like, you need haters. Like, let them do their job. Like, they're here to hate. Let them hate. And <laughs> if you don't have any haters, then you're you're not doing a good enough job because people <laughs> should not like you. You know, and that's you are you are here as a human being, in essence, or not even sorry, not a human being, but as an artist, you are here to polarize opinion. You know, like, and that's important. That's why I think some of the, the great great bands and artists of our time have done that. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that we're one of them, but I mean. We've obviously done enough to be around for 15 years and be on our seventh album. So we've got a lot of haters, which is good. And some of the songs, they have the dance elements to them. So on the surface, they can sound quite upbeat. They can sound quite positive. But when you actually dig a little deeper into some of the lyrics, I mean, with the singles, you had the You Could Lose Your Mind Trying to Understand Mine, uh, Make Me Feel Alive So Dead Inside, Fucked Up in a Beautiful Way. It's almost like emo but sounds happy <laughs> was that kind of an intentional juxtaposition and like a contrast i think that kind of like sums me up as a person to be honest <laughs> um, i'm emo as fuck but i come across as a relatively happy person um yeah i, I think there's there's I, I we've always been interested in that that notion and that idea of like either making a song sound sonically and musically like quite dark but then having like a really like positive message in it and on the flip side of that having a song that feel like beautiful way which does feel like quite energetic and happy but even even that song is like to be fair that song is celebrating um how fucked up we all are you know and, and, and appreciating the misfits and appreciating you know i've when we were writing when we were tracking the song I was like i want people to be in the crowd turning around to each other and being like yeah, we're fucked up and isn't it beautiful? You know, like that kind yeah. of idea that like we are different and it's because we're different that, you know, we matter more in that, in a weird way. I mean, um, Celebrating yeah. differences and oddities rather than all being the same and being normal, I guess. Fucking a hundred percent. I think that's what rock and roll is. Right. And like, and that's the whole point of, in a way like rock music is dominated. Like in terms of longevity there, 
there isn't another genre that really has that in terms of like you still have those arts that have been around for 35, 40 years. And I think that's because they cultivate this appreciation in which it's people that don't feel like they're being represented in other spaces. And so I think, you know, that again is comes back into the songwriting and when we were putting together like a song like Sucker Punch, it's kind of, it's looking at the fact that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of negative connotations in that song. Um, you know, talking about like, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm nihilistic, call me pessimistic, but really what is the point in making a noise? Like it's, it's talking about the fact like I'm getting sick and tired of shouting and, and letting people know how I feel when no one's listening, you know? And I think, I think it's sometimes you have to write those songs to you, for yourself, but then also for other people that are going to listen to it and go, yeah, that's me too. And thank you for writing my song. And I think that again, has been one of the strengths of You Meet Six for, for you know, board, approaching almost a generation of, of rock fans that we've been kind of like saying and, and writing what they're feeling at the same time. That was definitely the thing that at the start was the thing. We were like 15, 16 year old kids and we were talking about being 15, 16 year old kids, you know? And I think there's that, <clears throat> there's been a natural evolution. So it's almost like this band has been a nonstop diary of sorts, a journal of sorts of like where, you know, a group of five men where they are, where they were when they were 15, 16, when they are now in their thirties. Um, and I think that's, for me, whenever I listen to our older records, I have a real appreciation for that. And I'm kind of I'm really glad that I've been part of something that could document that as well. And I think you've never been shy, as you say, of saying what you want to say. I know you did that single, Our House, which tackled climate change, let's say, and because Our House is on fire, it was raising money for those charities in Australia after the, the wildfires. I mean, in terms of 2021 and going forward, obviously we're hoping that tours and things can start again. Um, have you got any plans of doing anything with your touring in terms of like reducing carbon footprint and things like that? Good question. Um <laughs> I think when we start actually knowing where we can and can't tour, we'll be able to work out exactly how we do that. Um, but in a, and something that doesn't have as much weight and, but it's, it can still be practical. Um, you know, we talk a lot in our band and online about like our social responsibilities when it comes to like, even something as simple as our diet, you know, like, cause that has, a, you know, the animal agriculture is, probably one of the biggest, I think it's the second biggest uh, emissions of CO2 and, and green greenhouse gases. So it's like, that for me is like a start. And I think, I remember when Coldplay came out and said they were going to do all their touring was going to be, I don't know how they're planning on touring, but they were like, we're never going to use a plane again. We're never going to use a truck again. All this sort of stuff. I was like, well, I don't know how you're going to tour. So a really long time on a boat. That would be like a year long tour to get yeah. to some places. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's, it's important to, um, obviously practice what you preach and, and also like, you know, at least contribute in a way that you can. And I think something as simple as, as yeah, as your diet and, and understanding that relationship between having a plant-based diet and, you know, and not, and what that is doing to the planet. But it's also that song really came from and stemmed from um, just being so aware of this incredible noise that's been made by a younger generation about how like they wanted to be heard and wanted to be respected as people that were and a generation that were going to be suffering because of what we're doing right now. Um, and I think it's says a lot in, in that it was a, you know, what a 14, 13 year old girl that really took to the streets and inspired people all over the world um, to talk about climate change more prominently than we have done in years and years and years. So, um, I, yeah, when, when I was, I was seeing that footage and then at the time when we were, because I, I think some people, I could understand why some people might be like, Oh, the, the calling a song, our house on fire is quite literal. And then donating to the Australian, um, what would you call it? You know, I guess the charities, but like, I was right. We wrote that song, and then as we were coming out of the studio, this the the wildfires were happening, and I was like, "Fuck! It's 
there's got there's something the universe is saying something here we've got to go, like we can't just because we I don't think we were going to use a song for the record it wasn't going to go on Sucker Punch I was like we've got to use a song for something um, I think we were more like it was more like a a love child of me and Dan just having a laugh at five in the morning do you know what I mean like we were completely wasted making a song I don't think we were necessarily int- intending it to be to have the weight it's gone on to have and like also you know to um to for, for me to sort of be talking about something that's completely like out of our comfort zone that we haven't really ever done anything political or environmental with our music so but it's a it's a special song and it's kind of taken a life of its own to be honest like it's still in terms of the stream world it's one of our one of the songs that people are listening to more and more um, than they are some of our other quote unquote hits. So yeah, people like it, which is good. And speaking about that, you've got the anniversary uh, for Hold Me Down. The shows had gone on sale and had been selling out. Obviously you couldn't celebrate the way that you wanted to. Have you got anything else that is, is planned for it that you can tell us about or how are you feeling about celebrating it? <laughs> to be honest, so basically we've all, the, the kind of the anniversary has been and gone because it was January, 2020. And like, we obviously, we were planning on doing something later on in the year to be like, I don't know what we were going to do. Or we weren't even thinking about doing a show, mm-hmm. to be honest. Um, and then we were having a conversation during, I don't know, what, where lockdown two, three, 10 million. I don't know how many lockdowns we've been now, but like we were having a conversation. Lock- permanent, never really finished. Yeah. Permanent lockdown, yeah. And we were having this conversation about you know, what an incredibly shit year it's been and also how positive it's been in times. But like, we really recognise how much joy our fans got from the Tape of Colour shows that we did a few years ago. And at the end of the day, I was like, that's the only reason we're here now is because of people like that. So, you know, we don't need to make a big song and dance about it with this, but like we should do so because it might, you know, it might really be something that people have, put in the diary and it's the only thing they're looking forward to this year, you know? So it's like for us and to do it in our home, essentially our home musical hometown of Kingston. I mean, Bank of Records was the shop, that the, the place that I bought my first set of records in. Kingston Peel was one of the venue, the first set of venues we ever properly played. We used to go and see all the American bands that would come in. If we can go to their show in London, they'd be playing the Kingston Peel. And so Bank of Records is, is kind of very, and has always been very present in our band and the DNA and the spirit of that were quite similar. John Tolley and his team in terms of, they really, really care about music and they really, really care about the artistry behind it and, and that being celebrated. So we were like, we're not going to do a tour. Let's just put something together. And yeah, I'm looking forward to doing it. Um, but we have equally big plans um, for 2021 because another one of our records is turning 10 uh, and it's probably the big one for us. So I'm sure we're going to celebrate that in due course as well. But January is a time for reinvention for a lot of people. Obviously there's veganuary and things as well. Lots of people are going to be trying perhaps a plant-based diet. Are you making any resolutions for the rest of 2021? So I was going to do dry January, but then I was like, we're putting out a record. So that's not going to happen. <laughs> well, I, 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 ever. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I knew that at some point, like I'll either be drowning myself in alcohol to numb the pain of how badly the record's bombed or, <laughs> or I'll probably be celebrating hopefully. So, um, yeah, I won't be doing dry January. I think, I don't know. I, I've taken up a few different, like, um, a few different kind of like sporting habits over the last few years, like boxing and, and mixed martial arts and football and stuff like that that I've tried my hand at properly. So I maybe get into, I don't know, something else. I've always wanted to like maybe do judo or something like that. So maybe there's something in that. But I haven't got any big New Year's resolutions. I've never I don't think I've actually ever kept a any of them. I don't think so anyone has. I think a lot of the time it's resolution is don't make a resolution for most yeah. people. It's a massive cop out, but I back it as well. So yeah, maybe I'm gonna do that. Every year I'm like, oh, I'm gonna eat healthy, and then I'm just back on like the vegan pizzas again and the junk food, and it's like that lasted three days. <laughs> and then like, <laughs> yeah. all the new stuff comes out for veganery. It's like I want that. I want like yeah. ten of everything, and it's like the thought was there. I tried. It's like yeah, yeah, exactly. You had every intention. There was one last thing that I have to say because this made me laugh for a solid five minutes the other day. This whole emo pappy thing that is taken off on Twitter where either fans are calling you it or you're calling yourself it. Where has that come from and why is this a thing? Right, okay. So basically, um, 
every the majority of our fan base know that I'm quite into Drake, uh, and obviously he's Champagne Pappy yeah. on socials. And um, our fans kept on calling me like Daddy, and I was like, please don't, because uh-huh. that just makes me feel sad. Um, and then like I, I can't remember what it, I, I replied to one person saying something like, "If anything, call me Emo Pappy," and then. <laughs> Um, as like a piss take, obviously, and then uh, yeah, more and more people. I, it's like if I get a message on Instagram, usually it's started by being like, "Just want to say I love you in the band, my Pappy." Um, <laughs> uh, fuck yeah! So yeah, sometimes I just yeah, sometimes take like the piss out of myself mainly by using it. But it's I don't. I, I, like I don't. His own. <laughs> I don't. It's taken. Like, I don't think it should continue much further. To be honest, hopefully it won't. <laughs> You have put it in your Twitter bio. And when I, I saw that, I mean, I what was it? Emo Pappy can't help you now. I was like, is this is this a thing? Like, are you going to make merch with it on? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to edit my Twitter bio right after this conversation to kill <laughs> this. Like, the journalists have found it. We are killing it now. Please Not don't right. come to me for ruining the Emo Pappy thing. <laughs> but I did laugh for a solid five minutes when Good. I saw that. There you go then. There you go. It, it, it served its purpose. It made somebody laugh. <laughs> well thank you very much for your time good luck with the record not long now until it comes out so thank you thank you very much for your time cheers